USC is one step closer to their first Big Ten Conference Media Day. You are Locked On Trojans, your daily podcast on the USC Trojans, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Right on, everyone. I'm your host, Mark Culkin, and thank you for making Locked on USC your first listen every day. Whether you're watching on YouTube or wherever you'd like to download your podcast, we are free. I appreciate your support, and your appreciation for the show would mean a whole lot. If you're watching on YouTube, become a subscriber. It's easy. It's free. Hit the red subscribe button, and when you hit that thumbs up, you really set this show off in a whole other direction. So do it often. Do it a lot. And because Locked on USC comes at you five times a week, hit the bell notification button and you will not miss one episode. So, yep, this past Friday, July 21st, it marked the final Pac-12 Media Day for your USC Trojans. And I have to be brutally honest, they should have just kept this event in Los Angeles for this last year. Las Vegas is a fun place to visit, and it's a great place for conventions and a whole lot of other stuff that we don't talk about, kind of like Fight Club. Uh, However, I got a question. How hard is it to find a venue that can accommodate everyone with not only a place to sit, but working Wi-Fi? There was just lots of standing up in the back of the room. That's all I'm going to say. And there was a lot of strain going on with people's hotspots. Just going to say that also. So the Pac-12 Media Day was held at the Zook Nightclub, which itself is pretty nice. And I imagine if you're going to a hotspot nightclub, this would have a great vibe. Now... I may or may not have any personal experience to draw from. However, the decor, the lighting, the whole VIP booth seating arrangement, uh, that's exactly how how I would kind of envision what a gentleman's club would look like. Not that I've been there. Uh, But again, just to... The Pac-12 does some really weird stuff, and I, I think... Commissioner George Klyovkov called in a favor. He's from Vegas, lives there. I don't know. Maybe he got a deal. Uh, And he was... One thing I will say about the commissioner, uh, he runs a tight ship. He was on time. He took the stage at 8 8 a.m. He and uh, his sidekick, Merton Hanks, and uh, the athletic director from Utah, last name Harlan. Mark, I believe is his first name. So... Look, I was joking about it last week. I, I'm sure the commissioner, the commissioner would have much rather been somewhere else. I know that if I had some sick days, uh, I probably would have used one for Pac-12 Media Day. There's just... Going up on the stage and not having a new media rights deal to talk about after a year, yeah, that's just, it's not a good look. Almost everything the commissioner said uh, when he was up there on the dais, it just felt really disingenuous, just from the get-go. Quote, speaking of football, the Pac-12 is the strongest it's been in two decades. Okay, end quote. Uh, Now, look, I fully understand the need for a positive spin. He's dealing with a lot of, you know, noise coming from the outside. However, uh, no, (laughs) Um, the Pac-12 conference is not the strongest it's been in 20 years. When you're losing the most significant piece, excuse me, significant pieces, I'll give UCLA a little bit of credit here, they are in Los Angeles, uh, to a competing conference, it is not a sign of strength, regardless of how many data points uh, the commissioner felt compelled to talk about. Such as, here's another one, quote, we have the reigning Heisman Trophy winner returning to a Pac-12 school, I emphasize, to a Pac-12 school, for the first time since 2005, 
and have several of the most highly touted challengers for the Heisman. End quote. Yes, it's true. The conference, finger quotes, has the returning Heisman winner for the first time for the first time since 2005. But the school that accomplished both of these feet, both of these feats, accolades, um, you should probably refer to as USC or the University of Southern California, which is home to eight of the Pac-12 Conference's eight Heisman Awards. So that quote and the way it was parsed from the commissioner, it felt intentional. Because I, I literally, I, I'm going to go back and you, everybody go back and check the transcripts. I don't think the commissioner mentioned USC or UCLA's, UCLA by name one time during his remarks. So while it's true the conference has the reigning Heisman Award winner coming back in 2023, uh, next season USC will be taking eight of the conference's Heisman Awards to the big conference for their trophy case. And then when the Q&A started, Commissioner uh, Klyovkov, the emperor, who already has no clothes, he was fully exposed. Because he was asked about the new media rights deal that everyone, you know, rightfully wanted to talk about. And he, he just ended up looking really bad. He said, quote, we are purposely not going to talk about the new media deal so we can focus on football today. And then when he was pressed, you know, does that mean you have a deal in place? Uh, Klyovkov said, I wouldn't read that much into it. Okay. For the life of me, I cannot figure out why he would say that football was the day's focus and not have an update. And then also say that the, that the longer it takes, the better it is for the conference because more options are open for a deal. It was just a very bizarre response. Uh, he talked about the conference's strength in recruiting having never been stronger. That was another one of those data points that he liked to use. Uh, I don't know if he was looking for clout or what, but all I know is that when since he opened that door, uh, I walked right through it. And when Utah's head coach, Kyle Whittingham, took the stage, uh, and I'm going to be honest, I could have asked this question to all of the head coaches, but Kyle was up first. So I was hoping that with you know, um, Klyovkov's comments still kind of relatively fresh in everyone's mind regarding recruiting in the conference, I asked Coach Whittingham the following question. This is probably going to be the last time you get to play USC and UCLA in Los Angeles. Um, how is that going to affect recruiting for you, knowing that recruits' families from the area won't be able to watch their kids play in LA? Coach Whittingham responded, Quote, I would say to be determined. I think it certainly will have an impact on recruiting without a presence in Southern California. That's been a real focal point of our recruiting for years. I can't give you a great answer other than we'll have to see how that shakes out. But report back to me in a year or two. I'll have a lot, be I'll have a lot better answer for you on how that's going. Smiling. The word smiling was in parentheses. I must have struck a nerve because the person from the Pac-12 who put the quotes and notes added the parentheses smiling uh, along with Coach Whittingham's answer. Not one other answer included the emotional response emoji, so to speak, typed out um, when uh, the quotes were given to the media. And so just so everyone understands the context of that smiling that the Pac-12 chose to highlight and my observation of striking a nerve, later when the Utah players, Cam, uh, quarterback Cam Rising and safety Cole Bishop took, took over the stage, uh, you could sense that, well, you, it's not a, yeah, you could definitely sense that Utah doesn't like USC, especially when the media reminds um, the back-to-back -back conference champs of their preseason vote. Cameron Rising said, it is what it is. They can think whatever they want. Just find out come this season. As a reminder for everyone on the show, 
USC was the prohibitive favorite preseason to win the Pac-12 Conference. Utah, I think, came in second, third or fourth? Third. So uh, my BS meter started to sound off, and I mean, it went off loud when another question came up uh, regarding that was that had to do with between USC and Utah. It was Cam, it was Cameron's answer about how he and his teammates uh, felt about uh, before, and we emphasize before Caleb pulled up lame in the conference championship game with that hamstring injury, uh, because his answer can only be, in my opinion, it can only be described as per, pure manure. The question was big. It came from another media uh, person. Quote, big USC fan for half a century. Again, not me. It was another guy. You broke my heart last year, Cam. When the game was going, SC was up a couple scores. And when Caleb got hurt, quote, let me emphasize this. Was that when you felt the positive momentum shift to your side? Or did you think you were going to win despite that end quote? Um, Mr. Rising said, quote, no, we just trusted the process. A lot of times you don't really worry about what's going on on the other side. You just have to focus on what you guys have going on. We just kind of felt that it started to shift before that. We kind of just felt that the ball was going our way. Then we kind of, then we just started to get that momentum. Kind of took it. That just was a part of it. Uh-huh. Definitely the ball was going your way, Cam. As USC was about to go up 21 to 3 before Caleb pulled up with a hamstring instead of it ended up 17 to 3. You really want to you really want us to believe that? Okay. Oh man. I understand. I get it. Whatever. Look, next segment. Um, it's all as you can see on the rundown, it's gonna be all about. I'm going to be talking about USC's responsibility and how Lincoln Riley uh, reminded everybody of that USC is West Coast football, right? If you look at the rundown here, um, I, I was going over some Pac-12 media and some Pac-12 notes from, we started with Utah and the Commissioner George Klyadkov. I'll have more throughout the week. But in the next segment, um, USC's football responsibility and how it relates to the West Coast. This is from Lincoln Riley. We're going to talk about that. But first, we're going to talk about eBay Motors. Because for every championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. Guess what? It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs just the right fit. So the next time you need parts and accessories, Head on over to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can be sure every part you need fits right the first time around. Just add your ride to My Garage and look for the green check to know the part will fit. Or you get your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay is guaranteed fit only, available to U.S. customers, eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. So, Lincoln Riley gets USC. I want to make that perfectly clear. He understands the history as well as the responsibility of coaching at USC. But he also understands the responsibility and the history and how USC is West Coast football. When Lincoln Riley took the stage at Pac-12 Media Day, he said, quote, I think coaching or playing at USC is one of the great responsibilities in our sport. This is the program that is so important to the sport. He was talking about USC. To the success of football on the West Coast in general, and is such a great history. 
I think we should all see it like that, right? We're not, we're not owed the opportunity to do what we do at a place like USC. It's an honor to do it at that place, end quote. Let that sink in. I knew, you know, that Riley understood the power and the history of USC because he wasn't afraid to say out loud what everybody already knew but didn't like to admit. He took on the responsibility of saying he told the truth and he had no fear of offending the mob before that Trojans have even done packing up the truck, getting themselves ready for the Big Ten Conference. He understands that much of the burden for carrying West Coast, West Coast football, was, and it still is, solely, it, it's USC's fault. That's why uh, they have that burden. It's because they're their victim of their own success. Nobody else on the West Coast has had any type of sustained national dominance. Maybe a year here and there. That's it. So the part that Riley did not say out loud, but, you know, it was kind of inferred, is that once the Trojans are done with the Pac-12, they won't need to carry the states of Oregon and Washington, Arizona, and parts of California anymore. The Trojans are going to be stripped of that burden. Kind of like the Pac-12 is going to be stripped of eight Heisman Awards that belong to USC. Now the responsibility of representing West Coast football belongs solely to USC. So, as they said, heavy is the head that wears the crown. Lincoln Riley assumes that responsibility. Because, as he said, I think we all see it, referring to USC football, like that, right? USC football is West Coast football. The responsibility of coaching USC... Uh, is right up there with being the head coach of the Lakers or managing the Dodgers. Those are the two iconic pro teams. Regardless of what kind of season they're having, the fan base is loyal, passionate. I'm, look, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, Colin Cowherd one time said, he, he described USC football as somewhere in between the NFL and college football. It's got it's it's its own entity. It's got its own its own power unto itself. That type of coaching pressure isn't made for everyone. And, and neither is playing for any of those iconic brands, whether it be the Lakers, the Dodgers, and in college football, the USC Trojans. It requires more than just raw talent. Just recognizing the massive undertaking of coaching and playing at USC is one thing. However, accepting the responsibility to be a Trojan, that says a whole hell of a lot more. This is why, you know, USC picks the recruits that they would hope to, would like to see future success at USC. And it's also why the transfer portal chooses USC. I'm going to have a recruiting update in the next segment, as you can see on the rundown. It's, this is why Mason Cobb used the transfer portal to leave, his, to leave Oklahoma State, where he was very successful. Team captain, leader, pretty much had whatever he wanted. <clears throat> I asked Coach Riley during the lunch break if Mason Cobb has the same type of personality, attitude in the locker room that Travis Dye brought over to USC during his one year in PAC. And Lincoln Riley told me, he goes, man, you know what, Mark? I never thought about it that way, but yeah, definitely. And the reason I brought that up to, to Coach Riley was because Mason, <laughs> it was kind of a funny moment. He reminded Riley and Caleb Williams up there on the stage of what happened the last time they saw each other when they were on opposite sidelines. It was kind of a ha-ha. Mason Cobb moment to kind of remind uh, Lincoln Riley and Caleb who won that game. Look, this is why you make Locked on USC your first listen every day, because I'm going to bring you these types of insights from behind the scenes. Not many people get to have lunch with Lincoln Riley at Pac-12 Media Day. I'll talk more about that later this week. Uh, look, 
Caleb Williams and Mason Cobb also joined Riley on that private jet to Las Vegas. It was the first time for Mason. It was just another day in the life for Caleb Williams. But the moment wasn't lost on Mason when he explained his thoughts on Riley's choice to bring him to represent USC uh, at Pac-12 Media Day. Quote, it meant a lot. One of my goals coming here was to attend Media Day and to be the voice of the defense. When Lincoln reached out to me, it was surreal. It brought tears to my eyes. This was something that I worked my whole life for. This is a big deal for the coaches to put me in a position. I think I proved myself well in the spring, so I think it's meant to be, but I'm blessed, end quote. But that also means that Mason took on the responsibility of bringing everyone together so the defense can, and this is in his own words, allow him to work in depth and make sure everyone knows who they're guarding, but why they need to step this way, limiting wasted movements, all that stuff. I, I think just crafting and I guess making everything, I guess, tighter, tightening up everything, making sure everything is all smooth, end quote. I mean, that's what the coaches are for. And that's a lot of responsibility to accept for one year with so much on the line. Remember, he left a good place in Oklahoma State. Ultimately, USC has the responsibility of winning championships and representing the West Coast football. And that's going to carry a lot more weight while USC now is regularly playing teams in Ohio and Michigan and Indiana and Pennsylvania, up and down the East Coast, Michigan, excuse me, Maryland, New York. They're now a national team. I tried to explain to Riley during our lunch uh, that if he leads USC to another national championship, he'll never have the responsibility of paying for another meal in Los Angeles. And he, he kind of laughed, he, he laughed the idea. He, he laughed at that notion, but I, I think he also knew that I wasn't joking. I, I had a serious look on my face. I said, coach, I'm not joking. But I'm gonna have a lot more on tomorrow. Uh, I'll have a lot more tomorrow on USC's last Pac-12 media day as we inch closer to fall camp, which starts on Friday. All right, so Monday, coming out of the weekend, this is why you're here, locked on USC. You want everything that's going on. Well, let's do a little bit of a July recruiting update. June was great, and July even got off to a pretty hot start. You know, USC got went out, got a defensive lineman, out-recruited Penn State and Ohio State for David Polipoli, big defensive tackle, 300-pounder. However, since then, three of the highest-rated players on the Trojans' target list ended up picking Tennessee, Oklahoma, and Notre Dame. First, Mike, wide receiver Mike Matthews and running back Taylor Tatum. They were, those guys were big time wants, but they weren't essential needs. I think everybody needs to understand that. Still, you want to win those battles when you're USC and you're going up against Tennessee and Oklahoma. You know, the, you want to win the battles for the number one player in the country. Even if they're not a need, from a optics point of view, you want to win those recruiting battles. I told everyone who watches Locked on USC heading into the weekend that I felt Kingston Viliamuasa was feeling Notre Dame. I wish I was wrong. However, on Sunday... Uh, KVA, he allowed his faith to guide his decision, and he picked the Fighting Irish over both USC and Ohio State. Kingston said, quote, Honestly, man, I couldn't see myself there, referring to Notre Dame, but I could at the other two schools. 
I felt God wanted me to have faith, which required trusting in what I could not see, end quote. Now look, I know God speaks to people in a lot of different ways, but that response is really hard to follow. The question is, why would someone want you to go somewhere that you can't envision yourself being at? I mean, that is literally the ultimate leap of faith. Again, quote, I could see myself at the other two places, USC and Ohio State, so I chose the one I didn't. Heavy sigh. Yeah, the mind of a young adult. I think what it meant was he's being tested to go against what he thinks is, is right and to, to trust the journey. It's either that or someone else is guiding him besides God's message to believe, to kind of have, to believe and just follow that blind loyalty. It just doesn't, I don't know. It's a big decision to, to go someplace where you, you don't have that gut feeling to go there. Look, I, I do get the sense that he wants to leave L.A. I, I kind of get that impression. And I'm gonna, just going to make a few more points on this, and now I'm going to move on regarding Kingston's recruitment. Number one, uh, he and his family put a high value on faith. Nobody should doubt that. Uh, nobody should also doubt that USC's defensive scheme still has a lot to prove. Ohio State's defense doesn't. However... Uh, Notre Dame is a place where football and faith, you know, they, they come together, much like it does at his high school, St. John Bosco. So while football is a religion in Columbus, Ohio, it does have a lot of vices that Notre Dame does not. If you've been to South Bend, it's a different place compared to, South, uh, to, than compared to Columbus and Los Angeles, for that matter. Number two. Notre Dame um, used its strengths of football and faith during this recruiting. No doubt about it. But I'm also very, I'm feeling very confident that NIL probably blessed the family with some tithing. The, look, the Bible does say those who pay their tithes and offerings are greatly blessed. So, number three, and this is important to remember, Consider this my Hail Mary. <laughs> uh, the Trojans can test Kingston Vileamu Asa's faith as signing day gets closer and closer. Remember, we're coming up on the end of July. The first signing period is in December. Because if the Trojans get to the playoffs, God may send Kingston another message. And this one he will see coming. It's going to be the same message, and, and it's going to be the same message for everyone who is kind of down on USC recruiting right now and believes it's a mess. Try and remember, US, USC recruiting going into year two with Lincoln Riley is infinitely better following an 11 win season that nobody saw coming last year. And considering the mess that Lincoln and Lincoln Riley inherited, I think he's done enough cleaning up to put the house that he's building as we speak back on the market. So while the portal is the transfer portal is being used as a band-aid, the fact that the Trojans are actually able to stay in the recruiting game with these recruits to the end, um, it could still make a difference later in December. Look, I promise you. No one is happy with the best players in the state remaining skeptical, skeptical about USC, especially on defense, and choosing to go elsewhere. However, winning is still the best solution, and 2023 has a chance to close the deal. So, in case you were wondering, um, look, it's not over yet. Commitments in July, and in June for that matter, they don't mean anything until a letter of intent is faxed in 
during this time period. So there you go. One last note before we let you go on this first episode of Locked on USC this week. Uh, fall camp opens this Friday. On Wednesday, the team reports for their weigh-in and all that other kind of stuff, get their dorm assignments, yada, yada, yada. On Thursday, the media, myself, will be there. We're going to be checking in with Lincoln Riley again, as well as the assistant coaches. So there's a big week ahead, and you'll want to be here every single day with Locked on USC, which is a part of the Locked on Network, your USC team every single day. And when you're done making Locked on USC your first listen every day, you're going to go check out all the great offerings we have over there on wrsc.com, where I've got a lot of content, as well as does Eric McKinney, Scott Schrader. He's throwing up the recruiting content for you. Chris Arledge, he's got his musings. And Greg Katz, he's got his, in my humble opinion, the obvious, not so obvious, as well as the uh, Inside the Trojan Huddle weekly podcast that I will be a part of again this week. So join me, join Eric McKinney, join us on over there on wearelc.com if you want more insight to Pac-12 Media Day. So until that next episode of Locked on USC, which will be here tomorrow, everyone, you know what to do, right? <laughs>